Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order when you check out Row 1 Brand's Vintage Sports Victorium Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. If he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 Vintage NFL Helmet Poster. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. Hello, old sports. Welcome back to the Hello, Old Sports podcast on the Sports History Network. I'm Dan Newman. I'm joined, as always, by my brother, Andrew Newman. And we are here today to talk about LaSalle basketball, the basketball history of LaSalle College. Is it LaSalle College or LaSalle University? It was LaSalle College until sometime in the 70s or 80s, somewhere in there, it it became LaSalle University. So it was LaSalle College. It is now LaSalle University. We're going to leave that in. We usually we would cut something like that out, but I think that that given that there actually is an explanation because, and I folks, I was confused because I thought I'd heard Andrew refer to it as LaSalle university, but then I'm looking at the Tom Gola biography uh, by David Grisbowski, who you'll hear us interview here in a few minutes. And he refers over and over again to LaSalle college. So my confusion was warranted, but and also just to follow up on that and it'll, to add to the confusion, which when we talk about um, when we go to the, you know, when we have the interview and talk about the high school, because there's a high school that's associated with the school that has always been LaSalle College High School and still remains LaSalle College High School, even in the 30 to 40 years since the university, since the college has become a university, the high school is still officially LaSalle College High School. So We've not had an explanation this convoluted since the last time we talked about the Charlotte Hornets. So <laughs> it's not uh, really convoluted. I no, mean, no. high schools just stayed the stayed LaSalle College High School and the university became a university in I'm trying I was I, I get them confused because it was I know they have admitted women in like nineteen seventy and then at some point after that became a university. So So LaSalle is Andrew's alma mater. It is one of the big five in Philadelphia college, men's college basketball, and a program with some interesting history and some interesting stories. And this will kick off a few episodes where we talk about our alma maters and their respective sports teams this week. And this will likely be a two-part episode. We have Andrew's alma mater, LaSalle, university and talk about their men's basketball team and then following that we have some episodes at least one episode coming up on my alma mater boston university and their ice hockey program so a little bit of college sports here for the month of late march and early april before we get into this just a reminder to please like us, rate us, um, like us on Facebook, Hello Old Sports Podcast, rate us on Apple Podcasts or iTunes or whatever your podcast app of choice is. You can email the show at helloldsports at gmail.com. You can also leave a comment on the Sports History Network website. In fact, we got our first uh, comment requesting a specific topic for a future show episode a couple days back and we will in fact at some point in the coming weeks do a show on the go-go Chicago White Sox of 1959 so we're looking forward to that and look forward to hearing from more of you with comments questions and any show idea you know we are we are willing to cover almost any topic as long as it's one we feel like we can do competently so look forward to that um, and look forward to hearing from more of you Uh, Andrew how are you today? I am doing well. I am excited to talk about uh, the history of LaSalle University basketball and, uh, and my alma mater. There's a lot to cover and some of it really good. And then as we get to more recent history, some of the sort of complications, but there's some really good moments mixed in there as well. So yeah, it's, you know, it's, uh, I think the the LaSalle fight song, the lyrics to the LaSalle fight song sort of sum up sort of most people's relationship with the school. Uh, it, it starts, and it's a little cheesy, but it's 
fight, 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 fight on explorers, fight on for LSU, give them L, give them A, and then it goes from there. I've never really learned the rest of the words, but yes, that's. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously the reason that we're doing this is because they're Andrew's alma mater and he knows a lot about it and we thought it would be an interesting topic, but this is interesting because I think we'll get a little bit of this when we talk about uh, BU hockey in the coming weeks as well, which is that there's this culture around these sports, whether it's, you know, hockey in the Boston, New England area or basketball and particularly college basketball in Philadelphia. It's really kind of unique in that you have, you know, five or six teams in men's college basketball in Philadelphia, all of which have their own stories, all of which have been prominent in various times throughout the, you know, the last 70 or 80 years. So it really is, in addition to the story of a single college, it's also really, um, it's a good examination into a sort of a sports culture, a subculture in the city of Philadelphia. Yeah, we will address certain aspects of the big five and college basketball in Philadelphia, the big five itself and the history and the sort of fissures in it and the current state of it, which is not, it it was a lot worse 30 years ago. Thanks to Raleigh Massimino. We'll do the big five and sort of the palestra, which is the arena at the university of Pennsylvania. That can't be sort of folded into this episode. Obviously, it will nudge up against that, but maybe next March or whenever the time comes, there's an episode to be had about the Big Five and sort of the history of it, which will also include LaSalle. But here I just have some sort of the highlights of, of LaSalle's history with the Big Five just because it, it, you know, I wouldn't do it justice by by trying to cram it into an episode that's also about something else, but we will go over it. And for those who don't know, the big five is LaSalle, Penn, Villanova, St. Joe's, and Drex- not Drexel. Um, Temple. Temple. Temple's the other one. Um, all right, so why don't we go ahead and get started here, and given that you're the expert here, why don't you kind of uh, kick us off? Sure, and... You know, we do have an interview with with David Grzbowski, who wrote a book on Tom Gola. In a lot of ways, LaSalle basketball history really begins there, but there are some things that certainly should be covered prior to that, the history of the school, and then also or with the history of the basketball program, and then also with the school. So I figured we'll just kind of start at the very beginning. So LaSalle University, or LaSalle College, as we spoke about at the beginning, was founded in 1863. It was a Christian Brothers school, which um, for anyone who's not familiar, and I was not familiar before I uh, went to LaSalle, having not been raised Catholic, some of this stuff I didn't know. It's an order sort of like a, you know, a Jesuit school or a Franciscan school or something like that. And the Christian Brothers are a Catholic order, and they're devoted solely to the ed- to education. So like at my school, there were various brothers who most of them lived in, some of them didn't even live on campus. And then some lived on the first floor of a, or on the first couple of floors, I guess it was, of a, of a building on campus, on the main part of campus. And that was the brother's residence. And they would actually, you know, live there. And, you know, they were mostly all teachers and, you know, you'd see them out and about. And then my friend actually had a brother who, for whatever reason, did not live with the rest of the Christian brothers and lived in the first floor of St. Albert's Hall in my friend's dorm room when we were freshmen. That's where he lived in. He had like a bigger room with a, I believe, a kitchen and things like that. But um, anyway, so it's a Christian brother school. The school is named after St. John Baptiste de La Salle, who is the patron saint for teachers of youth. He lived in France from 1651 to 1719. Ironically, the school's athletic teams are named the Explorers. And the reason the school's athletic teams are named the Explorers is because there was another person sort of contemporary to St. John Baptiste de La Salle, René Robert, blah, 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 La Salle, who was also a Frenchman. And he was an explorer, you know, like in the vein of Christopher Columbus and Vasco da Gama and all of them. So early on in the, whether it was the 30s or the 40s or whatever, a Philadelphia sports writer before the team had an official name, referred to them in the newspaper as 
the explorers. Sort Even of though it was a different LaSalle? He didn't know that. So okay. He, I guess assumed it was named after the LaSalle who is, you know, who was an explorer. So sort of like how, you know, the Highlanders, the New York Highlanders became the Yankees. And one of the reasons for that was it was shorter for news, you know, newspapermen started just calling them that. That was sort of the genesis of the LaSalle explorer name. And it's stuck to this day. And it's kind of unique. You know, there's not too many other explorers. So the school, and, and we'll get into the basketball program in a minute here. The school kind of bounced around initially when it was founded, it had some different locations throughout the city. You know, this was the 19th century and sort of different one building places at one point in center city. And then in a few other areas of the city until ultimately in 1930, they settled on 20th and and I'll pronounce it correctly for this. It's 20th and Olney. It's O-L-N-E-Y. I always, my natural pronunciation of it, whether it's my accent or whatever, I would pronounce it Olney, O-L-N-E-Y, but I will make sure to pronounce it correctly now at 20th and Olney in North Philadelphia. And just to go local for me for a second here, there's a town in Maryland called with the same spelling and they call that Olney. So you, you wouldn't be wrong. Most of the time I pronounce it Olney, to be honest, I'll say 20th and Olney, but... Somebody like when David was on, will be on, correction, they all pronounce Colony. So it's, you know, been in that location since 1930, North Philadelphia. We may, as we go on, touch on a little bit of, of the area and things like that. But, you know, I want to focus mostly on the basketball program. But um, been basically in the same location since then. There's been some expansions and things, but still the main cross street for LaSalle is 20th and Olney. And to sort of go, you know, this is a sports history podcast. Correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't the campus sort of near where the uh, Shy Park and later Connie Mack Stadium, the same stadium, different names, isn't it kind of near where that is or that was? It's a few miles north of there. I, it's funny. I had always heard that it was a lot closer to where the Baker Bowl was, where the Phillies played before they moved into Shy Park. In the, in the teens and 20s. They're actually both the Baker Bowl and Shy Park were both pretty close to each other. Baker Bowl was a little more towards Broad Street, which is the main, again, for anyone who's not familiar with Philadelphia, the main north and south street that runs all the way from the very southern tip of Philadelphia, which is essentially where all the professional sports stadiums are. If you take Broad Street all the way north, you end up in the middle of the city at City Hall with the big statue of William Penn on the, uh, on the top of the City Hall. And then if you keep going north, you end up, you know, it, you can take Broad Street all the way to the northern end and towards the very northern, t- not, not right towards the northern border, but getting close, you're getting towards LaSalle. You hit Broad and Olney, and if you take Olney all the way down, you end up at, uh, or take only a few blocks down, you end up at, La- at LaSalle University's campus. So. And Broad Street is sort of one of the main thoroughfares in Philadelphia. The main north and south road, yeah. The Broad and Broad and Broad is the north-south road, Market is the east-west road, and where Broad and Market meet is literally City Hall. So the, uh, they finally settled there in 1930, and around then is when the basketball program began. I'm going to pull up the franchise index for LaSalle. The first year of the program was in 1931-1932. And, you know, again, any sport really that's not baseball or like any team sport that's not baseball or I guess hockey in Canada in the early 30s, from a league sort of organizational standpoint, only briefly or only tangentially resembles what it was in the post-war era. I think for a frame of reference, the first NCAA tournament was in the 39 season. So it was about seven years before that. Yeah, so it's, you know, you really can't find too many details of where they, you know, where they played and and who they played and that kind of thing. And, you know, most of these are are pretty good records for the most part, 15 and 8, 13 and 3, that sort of thing. But, you know, and I guess I knew this, but but before um, I was rereading some things and rereading David's book, and I didn't. I guess I'd forgotten or or whatever, just how bad a shape the school was in, in terms of enrollment prior to, and then during World War II, the 
school's enrollment really drastically dipped, as you could imagine. It was an all-male school, and, uh, you know, in the 40s, when it was a small school, when I was there in 2008 or 2004 to 2008. So enrollment in the 40s during World War II was obviously took a dangerous hit, but the school really after World War II and the GI Bill and, you know, being in a big city at the time, which I'm guessing was probably the maybe the third biggest city in the country at the time. I don't know if Los Angeles had passed it by then, but, you know, third or fourth biggest city in the country really saw an uptick in enrollment post-World War II. And that really brings us to the first basketball part of this I want to touch on, which was in 1946-47, LaSalle ended up with their first really legendary player. Unfortunately, the legend's been largely lost because it was 70, you know, at this point, almost 80 years ago. And to most people, LaSalle basketball history begins with Tom Gola. But before that, in the late 40s, was Larry Faust, the first big LaSalle basketball player, went on to a pretty lengthy professional basketball career, mostly with the Fort Wayne Pistons, did play a little with the Minneapolis Lakers and then the St. Louis Hawks. But while he was at LaSalle, and I'm just trying to pull up his uh, his numbers here, he was, um, you know, really the uh, first uh, pulled. I pulled up his professional stats. So bear with me one second while I get his college stats here. So, yeah, in four years at LaSalle, he uh, and again, stats are, are sketchy at best at the time, but averaged over 16 points a game in the late 40s when that was with inflation. That's quite a bit in today's college basketball, you know, and was really that first big player who put LaSalle basketball in a position of any kind of uh, of prominence while he was there. Yeah, he's one of those guys who kind of, you know, in the in the pre pre shot clock pre, um, you know, the NBA was integrated pretty early on, but it wasn't really fully integrated, probably. Um, well, I mean, that's obviously a sliding, a sliding scale, however you want to term that. But until Russell and Wilt and Baylor and those guys came in, it was still very much a, you know, a slower, you know, white man's league. And plus, prior to 54, you had you didn't have the shot clock. And Faust was actually on the Pistons team that won the ninth the 19 to 18 game that uh, I think against Minneapolis, that was against that um, sort of Harold did the, the bringing in of the shot clock, but he was definitely one of those guys of the early fifties in the pre Russell Chamberlain days who was, you know, a real star. He was an eight time all-star. He was a, um, he won a championship with Fort Wayne uh, when they won a championship in, or did, did they win a championship? No, they actually didn't win a championship. So I think they went to the finals a couple of times, but, you know, led the league in rebounding. So not in the Hall of Fame, which I think is a little bit interesting because he's a guy who, you know, contemporaries of him with similar statistics are in the Hall of Fame, but a really sort of a well-known and a star of the early NBA. Are there committees for the Basketball Hall of Fame like there are for the Baseball Hall of Fame that look at specific eras? I don't know what they do there. <laughs> I really don't. I mean, it's like and we have to do a Hall of Fame episode at some point where we talk about the baseball, basketball, football. Maybe we'll talk about hockey. Maybe we'll even bring some, you know, maybe we'll even talk about, you know, rock and roll and wrestling just to kind of, you know, do the whole Hall of Fame thing. We have to do an episode like that one day, but the basketball hall of fame is it, it's a nice idea, but it's, you know, when, when it, when you get an NBA star and then a division two coach, and then the, the all time leading high school basketball, the all time winning as coach in the history of South Dakota, high school basketball. And then you get it's somebody who was a star in, uh, you know, uh, the Czech Republic in the 1980s. It's just, I have no idea what the logic is to who they let in and why in the basketball hall of fame. And if you go to the basketball hall of fame, it really does. You don't get, you don't get the gist that you're at the main hall of fame of something like you basically get the gist and we're getting way off topic here, but like you get the gist when you go to the basketball hall of fame, it's essentially in a strip mall, you know, on the outside, it's not really recognizable at all. And it seems like you would see if like you went to the, you know, if you if you were at the state of 
Maryland Basketball Hall of Fame where you were like, oh, they did a pretty good job with that. But you wouldn't think you're at like, oh, no, this is the this is the Hall of Fame Michael Jordan is in. You know, what I, I mean? I've gone a couple times as a kid and then once in college and then once as an adult, like five or six years ago, my wife and I at Christmas one day um, we went and drove over. And every time I've gone, I've thought to myself, maybe I'm older now and I feel like and it'll be more interesting and I'm not remembering it well. But every time I go, I'm just so underwhelmed by it, which is why I'm surprised that Larry Faust isn't in it because eight times an all-star in the NBA, that's a pretty good career. There's there's plenty of guys who weren't in, who, who were all-stars a lot less than eight times who were in the Hall of Fame. Plus, since it's not just pro, it's college. And as you're going to talk about in a second here, he had a really good college career. It was also the first time uh, while Faust was at LaSalle, they made the postseason for the first time, actually twice in 48 and 50. They made the NIT. And as we'll talk about with David, the NIT was a very big deal at the time. I will say that sometimes LaSalle fans or people talking about LaSalle history, it's a little rough because they talk about LaSalle winning the NIT in 1952. And they're like, you don't understand. The NIT was a bigger deal than the NCAA in 1952. But then they won the NCAA in 1954. And it's like, well, they won a national championship. And it's kind of like, okay, which, so it's shifted in 1953. Is it? <laughs> you know, so the, um, the NIT was a bigger, a much bigger deal than it was now, you know, or ever, but it, Obviously, the NCAA tournament still existed as well. So they got there twice with Faust, once losing to Western Kentucky in the quarterfinals. And then in 1950, they actually won a game against Arizona and then lost to Duquesne in the second round in the quarterfinals. And then the next year after Faust was gone, they made the NIT as well in 1951, losing to St. Louis. That 1951 team was also the first year Uh, So again, it was the year after Larry Faust had left for the NBA and it was the first year that the, that they had had a new coach that year. And it was Ken Leffler who took over and he would be the coach the next several years as LaSalle experienced the greatest stretch that they ever have by a mile and what will forever be known as the Tom Gola era at LaSalle. So before we get to our interview, just a point on the NIT thing. I, I think maybe the way um, that might have stopped probably around that time in the early 50s. I think I think sort of after after the CCNY scandal in the early 50s, college basketball started to mean a lot less in New York City. And the NIT has always been played in New York City. And so I think right about then when when new york loses its college basketball prominence is when you start to kind of see the the nit receding a little bit yeah no it's just funny that it's always like well in 52 it was huge and then by 54 the fact that they won the ncaa was so much of a bigger deal i was like well all right i mean they were both big you could say that but you know absolutely so with that and since i have now invoked the career of tom gola and the absolute height of the glory days of LaSalle University basketball from 1952 to 1955. We will now go to an interview we conducted with another LaSalle alumnus who wrote a book a few years ago on Tom Gola. I actually spoke to him while he was getting ready to begin the sort of push of the book being published. He was just sort of letting some different alums know what you know, what the book was going to be about and that it was going to be coming and, you know, his process for writing it. So certainly a, a look into somebody that while a huge figure maybe doesn't have the national footprint that he should for somebody who had such a long and storied career in basketball. So with that, let's go to our interview with David Grisbowski as he talks about his book on Tom Gola, Mr. All Around the Life of Tom Gola. Okay, so we are now joined by David Grisbowski to talk about Tom Gola, the really beginning of the LaSalle basketball discussion can't start anywhere else but Tom Gola. And David, a few years ago, I spoke to when he was writing a book about uh, Tom Gola called 
titled Mr. All Around the Life of Tom Gola. It's a very good read on a subject that, you know, there's really not as much out there as you would, you would kind of hope from a, a book standpoint. First of all, David, how are you doing tonight? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk LaSalle basketball and, of course, uh, about Tom Gola. So thanks for having me. Absolutely. Yeah. When we were putting the book uh, or putting the episode together, my brother says, suggested, he said, oh, didn't you talk to somebody who wrote a book about Tom Gola a few years ago? We should try to, uh, to reach out to him and get something going. That's actually a good place for us to start sort of your process for writing the book. You grew up in the Philadelphia area, correct? Correct. Yep. Before going to LaSalle, sort of growing up, were you familiar with Tom Gola at all or his, you know, place in sort of college basketball history? Uh, not at all. But ironically, I grew up in the Juniata Park section of Philadelphia. So I'm, I'm pretty up to date with the Cat- Catholic League uh, basketball hype in Philadelphia. And I actually, as a kid, went to, I think, North Catholic versus LaSalle High School like championship game when they played at Gola Arena when I was in like probably like third, fourth grade. Um, so that's the only time I ever heard of Gola as the arena, but going to LaSalle, I never knew of his legacy. And obviously I, I kind of unearthed that and grew to that as my years gone by. But just to be blunt, like, you know, I didn't know anything about Gola before I got to LaSalle. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just real quick mention, and probably later on in the episode, I'll opine on this, but the arena at LaSalle is, is named after Tom Gola. It's called Tom Gola arena. And Unfortunately, not the arena is probably not a fitting namesake to the man and his career and contributions to LaSalle and some of the problems with the arena may surface later on in the episode when we talk about some of the more lean times for LaSalle. But um, yeah, you know, I, uh, I grew up in New York about an hour north of New York City. Obviously, my brother did as well. And I, I wasn't very familiar with really anything having to do with LaSalle before I got there, but it's sort of an interesting twist. My father's family is from Philadelphia. My father grew up in um, just outside the city until he was 14 and he moved to where I'm from. And my grandmother went to Olney High School and this would have been in the late 40s. So obviously Tom Gola went to LaSalle College High School and it you know was a product of the, the Catholic League and the Catholic school system. But, you know, very similar in terms of the geography. I think I read in your book that had he gone to sort of the local public school, it would have been on the high school. So that was just sort mm-hmm. of a button on it. How did you come to decide that you should write this book? And what was the initial process of that like? Sure. So um, I cover the basketball pretty heavily during my time at LaSalle, 2013 graduate. And it was right, it was probably like three months before LaSalle's uh, Sweet 16 run and actually the A10 tournament. Uh, you know, I did the collegiate, I did all the LaSalle TV, all the media stuff, communication stuff, which I majored in. And um, yeah, I just wanted to do like a follow up story of like, you know, what was Gola thinking of the LaSalle team that was doing good? They just beat Butler, last second shot, Ramon Galloway layup. Then I think the next game, then they lose to like UMass or something. And the next you know, game, they-, they beat VCU. VCU, they went sorry. On the road and beat VCU because they beat the two ranked top twenty teams in a row. Correct, but they did have like a a, a lesser tier loss during that like run for a couple yeah, games. Remember. I remember if it was after all that, and they had a, they played Temple in one of their last regular season mm-hmm. games, and they could have won the Big Five outright. You're right. You're right. Temple smoked them. I, that, <laughs> I mean, they they had a couple of tumbles there, but but Temple sure. was the one who uh, who really brought them back down to earth so to speak sure um, so so yeah um I, I i did a project for uh my my senior project and we did the history of lasalle explorer mascots and uh brother joe gravenstein who is uh you know brother archive university archivist we interviewed him and you know of course when you're talking about the lasalle explorer mascot you're mentioning the basketball program and of course when you mention a basketball program you're mentioning Tom Gola. So he said, Oh, I know Gola, you know, he's, he's, I'm very close to family. I see him once a month, we get dinner. And this was when Gola was in hospice. And I was like, well, Hey, I would love to meet Tom. Like, I mean, that'd be awesome. Like I'd love to do it, you know, just meet him and do a collegiate article. So I met him, uh, went to, went to the hospice care at St. Joseph's Manor and PA with brother Joe one Sunday. 
uh, met his wife, met his wife Caroline, talked to him. His speech wasn't that great then, but I interviewed him for like an hour and a half with Brother Joe, uh, just shooting the breeze, talking about things. And uh, I did a two part series in the Collegian. One was about how Caroline was, you know, a big supporter of LaSalle. You know, Tom can't physically be there. And, you know, she, she used to, I probably still does. I'm not sure if she still does. She used to, you know, swim weekly at um, the swimming pool. Like she, you know, she's Mrs. Gola. So you had some street cred there. Oh. And uh, I did a two part series on it. And I interviewed him like probably a month and a half before A10 tournament. And when LaSalle was like building up to, you know, be on the bubble. And uh, I did the articles and just kind of kept in contact with his wife and uh, you know, brother Joe, it was like, you know, someone should write a book about Tom Gola. His, his, his life's crazy. And, you know, I always appreciate the people, you know, cause I was in the TV field for a few years, kind of still am. I work in the media business mm-hmm. and um, you know, I always appreciate these reporters, these Seth Davises of the world, these other reporters that have job a, but they also have a, you know, like a side gig where like, they write a biography about Jackie Robinson or John Wooden or something that something like like a feather in their cap that they can go to that. Hey, like, you know, they're a reporter. Like you said, they had this book or documentary or something. Mm-hmm. And uh, randomly, I was like, you know, I should I should I want to write a book about Tom Gola and the stars aligned, called his wife and he got the OK. And, uh, you know, as I was doing the research, like stars aligned and it really was kind of like meant to be so. It went from, uh, I guess, where I'm getting at, it went from being a school project to a newspaper idea to actual book. Probably took about five years to complete, but if you dwindle it down, probably took about three, three-ish because, you know, obviously it wasn't my, you know, I wasn't writing nonstop every day for five years. It just took time and, and everything else. But uh, yeah, it's kind of cool to have a project turned into a, a book that you can get on the shelves. I started at LaSalle in August of 04. Because I graduated in 08. So I started in August of 04, which was not the best time for LaSalle basketball. But um, right around then, you know, learning about the history of the program and things like that, I had always, even back then, been led to believe that Tom Gola was sort of, yeah, he was alive. And I know you talk about the fall and what was it, 03, where he had the fall that kind mm-hmm. of, you know, I, I, I remember right around the Sweet 16, there was also a Daily News article where somebody from there had gone to interview. Yep. Maybe it was a, the Inquirer, one of the two papers. No, it was, it was Dick Girardi because okay. um, it's funny. I actually did the same interview with Gola. I mean, obviously, listen, Dick Girardi's a legend. Mm-hmm. I'm, friend, I'm friendly with Dick. He's a great guy. And, and I was like, man, I had this exclusive for the Collegian. And then Dick did it in Daily News. And I was like, man, Daily News, Collegian, clearly like, you know, who cares about a kid writing about, uh, you know, a newspaper article for a university. But I did the same. I'm not kidding. I did the same kind of follow up like three months before. and I just never put it out. Mm-hmm. And then, um, you know, because I, I don't know if you remember the Daily News had goal on the front cover. It was, a, it was uh, the back cover. Is like, what does Tom think about LaSalle? And it was kind of like, you know, um, what, what's Tom up to lately? How's he doing? And what does he think of the 2013 squad? So it's kind of cool. Yeah. And I, I remember sort of being blown away just because I'd always been led to believe that he was essentially like, for lack of a better word, like totally gone, you know? Sure. No, totally. I understand. They weren't able to get really much out of him. So Mm -hmm. to see that, yeah, there was obviously limitations in a lot of ways, but you're still able to get some sort of information and prompted. He was, you know, familiar with, he was able to give you something. I was, I was pleasantly Mm -hmm. surprised by that. And then, you know, obviously after that would have been what early, was it early 2015 that he finally passed? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, certainly it was timely to, uh, to get that written. And um, again, just to, we'll move into some of the actual stuff about his, sure. his life, but just once again, to, uh, to plug it, it's Mr. All around the life of Tom Gola. It is a little, I understand you have to do what you have to do. It is a little frustrating when I look at the jacket of the book and it's got the temple logo right there. Um, <laughs> yeah. By temple university press. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny. Um, I, I, I don't say I'm a temple hater, but the only, the only things I like about temple is temple university press and Fran Dunphy uh, and John Chaney. I like John Chaney too, but uh, yeah, he was, I was fortunate enough that he was the coach the first two years I was at LaSalle. So we got to see a couple of games that hit, cool. you know, up close and personal. So, and I just, David, I just want to raise a point here. You talked about sure. John Chaney and, and Fran Dumpy for that matter. You interviewed some really interesting people for this. Mm-hmm. I, Bob Pettit, Jerry Lucas, Tom Heinsohn, Bobby Knight even. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. Um, 
Bobby Knight was the most nerve wracking phone call I ever, ever called in my life. Um, <laughs> tracking down. I mean, the coolest thing for me is actually tracking down these people. Mm-hmm. Um, like uh, Bob Cousy, like I, I went through Tom Gold's phone book with his wife by, you know, and just said, okay, Bob Cousy, you think this is still his number? And long behold, it's his, his, his number still works from a phone book that was probably created in 1960, 1970. And he's, and the phone worked and he picked up and I said, you know, Hey Bob, it's David. I'm writing a book about Tom Gola. Can I get 40 minutes of your time or whatever? And, you know, I had that kind of, you know, contact and, uh, you know, I said, talking to, to Cheney, talking to Dumphy, all these guys were just great. And, uh, you know, talking to Bob Pettit is a legend. Um, uh, Jerry Lucas, Tommy Heisen, Tommy Heisen actually just passed away a few months ago. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really cool to, uh, I, I kind of want to listen back to some of the, the legends I talked to just to see, you know, cause I, I've recorded all my interviews. Mm-hmm. Um, they're kind of raw because, you know, I, where there's a lot of it's being done on the phone or in person. I only did probably 15 or so interviews in person. Cause obviously like, you know, I'm not going to go up to Boston to interview Koozie, although that'd be, that would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. But yeah, I think uh, interviewing these these legends is probably the coolest part for me is, like you said, um, going through a phone book and be like, oh, wow, I wonder if, you know, stars, I forget how the, the old school phone books work, but, you know, you got to figure out the letter and the mm-hmm. number and it worked. I'm like, holy crap, this is kind of cool that, you know, Bob Cousy has had the same number and probably lived in the same house since 1965. And, you know, and it, and it was kind of cool to kind of bring that for, um, bring that, bring that to, you know, the forefront and actually get an interview. So it's kind of cool. And I'd, I'd imagine, and this is speculation, but a guy like Cousy or even Bob Knight, it's, they're probably more willing to talk about something like Tom Gola or somebody like Tom Gola, who, I mean, how many times do you think somebody wants an interview with Bob Cousy about his days as the Celtic, you know, with the Celtics or with Bobby Knight, how many times has he had to answer the same questions about, you know, Indiana or whatever, but then it's like, Hey, mm-hmm. Here's this guy who, I mean, how often in the last 30 or 40 years do you think they even get asked about Tom Gola? They're probably sure. willing to to speak since it is such a, you know, unique topic, at least in terms of the the narrative. So Yeah, totally. And also too, I'm 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 doing this for my next book I'm writing now, and I'm finishing up this summer. And, you know, you, you just gotta always make the extra phone call. Jeff Perlman, who's a uh, New York Times bestseller writer, he's written a lot of great books. Talked to him, picked his brain, and he says, always make that extra phone call because you never know. Yeah, on, on a piece of paper, you're making a list. Oh, uh, so-and-so was um, a janitor or the, the water boy. But guess what? That If you call that person, they might have the, the best story that you can put in your book. <laughs> or, or you know, then let me call the next door neighbor who doesn't live there anymore, but knew his son and played with his son or, or vice versa. So it's kind of cool to uh, unearth those stories. And, and again, every, and, and the cool thing, you kind of going back to what you said, like everyone wants to talk too. like selfishly that. Yeah, sure. Like you've talked to Koozie, like I'm sure he'll tell you about stats, accolades and Bill Russell and so forth. And, but you know, you got to beef them up a little bit. You kinda, it's, it's kind of a long process. So you got to like, kind of like, like grind into it and not just be like, Hey, what do you think about this? It's just like, you know, be interpersonal and then get to the, the crux of what you're trying to go after. Did Bobby Knight say or do anything that made it nerve wracking or was it just the fact that he was Bobby Knight and you knew he wa- knew who he was? Yeah. Um, he left a voicemail on my phone and I, I don't think I have it anymore. Oh, geez. I'm going to find I'm trying to after this. I'm gonna actually going to see if I have it. But I went through their um, I think I went through Indiana or or maybe Texas, 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 uh, athletic. A lot Direct, of department. Direct, yeah. Yeah. Department. Sorry. And, you know, they kind of gave me like, hey, I'll pass it all on your information. Uh, I'm sure he gets like requests all the time for stupid stuff. <laughs> and, you know, one day I just had a, I had a voicemail. I was like, David, Tommy Knight, I heard you want to talk to me. And, you know, I, I think it was like a 14 minute, 15, 20 minute conversation. And, you know, I, I think I got a few like kind of like very direct answers. Like, what do you think of Gola? Um, oh, well, he's, he was great. OK, but like. That's great. I understand that, but tell me about like, you know, <laughs> I, tr- I try to get those um, long winded quotes, not just like, how do you, what do you think of Tom Gull? Oh, he was a great basketball player, but like, tell me, all right, paint me a picture. And, you know, instead of, you got to set it up. Whereas he gives you the story of him listening to the radio as a kid, mm-hmm. listening to the 1954 championship game or, you know, 1955 game against Bill Russell in San Francisco. It was, it was very nerve wracking. And uh, it's definitely a highlight in, 
and again, definitely add some street cred to, to put down the book that, you know, I talked to these legends and yeah, Bobby Knight, I mean, living legend and frightening, frightening film call, but it was fun. <laughs> Absolutely. So this is actually a pretty good segue talking about some of the stories and things. And we mentioned John Chaney and I'll, I'll dive into your book here and this will bring us right to right before Tom Gola was preparing to go to LaSalle. So this would have been 1951. He was a player at LaSalle College High School, which at the time was actually still located within the confines of LaSalle College at the time. It was all in the same area. And for anyone who doesn't know, city of Philadelphia, the college basketball landscape is kind of divided in two. There's the Catholic League and there's the Public League. And having gone to LaSalle College High School, he was named, Tom Gola was named the player of the year at his high school. And then John Chaney was actually the public league player of the year the same year and they had a banquet at the warwick hotel on south 7th street 17th street in center city philadelphia and david you want to just quickly talk to us about that story i'm in the uh in the bathroom at the hotel it's funny i actually heard um cheney say this story on wip probably the week after he passed and i know about it so i made sure to get it in the book in some capacity but to, 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 to be brief with it, it's kind of, I think they're at the Markman Awards ceremony, like you said, and John Cheney's trying to borrow or doesn't have, you know, the best garments and he didn't have a, a, a suit to wear. So he had an over, over large kind of sports coat, kind of looked out of whack and uh, they're about to announce his name pretty much in the ceremony and no one could find John Cheney and Golog goes in the bathroom looking for him and he's hiding because he's kind of embarrassed the way he looks because, of, you know, he's probably wearing like a, a 2XL or XL, and he's probably a size smaller or a medium or a medium, you know, size jacket. And uh, Gold goes into the restroom, finds Chaney and kind of tells him, hey, man, like, I'll go with you. Like, I got your back type of thing, which was kind of cool. And it kind of shows the relationship that Gola had, I mean, with people, with players. And, you know, you know, for back then, let's, let, you know, let's be real, you know, African-American and a white and a white man interacting with each other, you know, it was probably, that's another barrier that I think also shows back then too, that, they were very, you know, interactive as, as people, uh, as races, as players, like, you know, Gola played against Cheney and vice versa. So kind of cool to see him take under, under his wings a little bit. And, and that kind of story, you know, him like hiding in the bathroom. Um, it's kind of cool. It probably wasn't too long after that where John Cheney wasn't timid or embarrassed by basically anything <laughs> that might've been sure. one of the last times he felt that way. You, you tend to think of sort of like how you mentioned Bobby Knight as a kid listening to him in my mind, Bobby Knight was never a kid, you know, he <laughs> in that letter and yelling and screaming at people from the time he was born. It's kind of the same thing. John Cheney to me, I have no problem picturing him in like ill fitting wrinkled clothes because that was how he looked at temple. I have a pro I, I still almost can't process him being like, having to be coaxed out of a bathroom to yeah. you know, just to briefly touch on the, the recruiting aspect of it. What I was surprised was it came down to LaSalle. Obviously they were going to be, you know, being a Catholic school in the city he went to and having gone to LaSalle college high school, they were going to have an inside track. I was surprised that the team that he chose LaSalle over was North Carolina state. Mm -hmm. I would have thought it would have been, you know, another Philadelphia school or certainly not a school like, it's hard to imagine a guy born and raised in Philadelphia in that time and place in a sort of ethnic environment. And suddenly in the early fifties, he's going to go to North Carolina. It's hard to imagine that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's ironic too. I actually lived down in Raleigh, North Carolina, like 10 minutes from NC state when I was finishing this book. So actually at one point I was going to, I never got anything, but I was actually going to go and, see if NC state had any like archival stuff to like back in the fifties of them recruiting Gola. But yeah, it's, it, it's kind of interesting. You know, Gola's mom was kind of the, the influence with Gola staying local because number one, she just wanted to see her son play. Number two is from a, a large family, you know, four or five kids in the household. Uh, mm -hmm. Their grandmom lived them one point. So it was a big house and they went a very close knit community. Catholic up upbringing had a lot to do with that too. Because, you know, with the Christian brothers and, you know, if, I'm sure, yeah, yes, Gola probably could have got, you know, paid off. His family would probably have been well prepared if, you know, someone made an offer like NC State or, mm -hmm. or Kentucky. But, yeah, I was surprised, too, that NC State was kind of in the in the, the rings to get Gola. But it kind of makes sense because they had the high school basketball, like all-star games back then down south. So 
Uh, although Gola was just mainly playing uh, on the East Coast, in you know, New York, you know, Philadelphia area, you know, they were, you know, Gola was a household name in the 50s. In a way, you kind of, you know, Gola, you know, the Pete Maraviches of the world and, um, you know, got they, those those two players kind of like pass the torch to Bill Russell. Bill Russell passed the torch to the next player, next player, and then follow up the ladder of success to, you know, LeBron and Kobe and, and Jordan. Like, I mean, it's cliche to say that, but there's definitely – errors of big basketball players you can you can you know see who had you know all right this player was this two years and then next year is this player but yeah um yeah, nc state uh you know we, it would have been a totally different book if uh he went to nc state and i probably wouldn't have written a book if he, <laughs> if he did go to nc state so luckily he chose 20th and only it's funny too because this is right around the time when frank mcguire goes to unc in the early 50s and you know he frank mcguire was a born and bred new yorker and goes to UNC and that's where you start to see these players from the Northeast from sort of these urban ethnic, you know, Italian, Irish, German players, Jewish players going down to the South and specifically to North Carolina to play. So it's interesting. It it makes sense to me that around that time, a North Carolina school was a candidate for a guy from Philly. Totally. And also kind of non goal of kind of makes sense, but I kind of uh, talked to enough people and I couldn't get it to be accurate, but it goes back. This is, I'll bring it back to what I'm talking about with recruits. But like at one point, someone told me that Will Chamberlain was almost going to come to LaSalle. I don't know if you guys heard that story as well. I know that's always been one of the sort of great what ifs from back then was what if Wilt, and again, for anyone who's listening, although most people listening to this podcast are familiar with sports history, but Will Chamberlain is also from the Philadelphia area. He went to Overbrook high school and it's always been sort of the thing of what if he had stayed? What if he had gone to one of the local schools, you know, LaSalle mm-hmm. was a couple of years off of the Gola era where they won a national championship. You had all these high profile for the time schools there. What if he had stayed and gone to one of those schools and it segues nicely into a Wilt Chamberlain quote, about Tom Gola, which he he said at one point, I don't know when he said this, but he said, when I was growing up, you whispered the name Tom Gola because he was like a saint. And I know in the past, people, obviously in the past, because he's been dead for 20 years, but people had asked him about the greatest Philadelphia area college basketball players. And I'm sure some of this was shtick to appear humble, but they asked him, oh, who's number two on your list? And he said, I'm number two on the list. And that was obviously shocking to people. And that was his way of putting over Tom Gola because he said, no, Tom Gola, you know, I Gola would have been in college when Chamberlain was in high school and things like that. So he always sort of, Mm -hmm. you tend to think of those guys as from much different eras, but really there was, I mean, they were teammates and they only came a few years after each other in Philadelphia high school and then college basketball. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, like the whole, the whole Wilt thing, you know, they're really, they had a great relationship. Like Gola spoke at Wilt's funeral or services or ceremony, whatever you want to call it. And, mm-hmm. you know, that, that says a lot. And, you know, the fact that someone like Will is saying that, and, you know, I, when I saw those quotes, I, I guess I kind of like, you know, is this a cliche quote? Because, you know, I am a LaSalle grad. And I'm trying to like write the best version of like, you know, what do people say about Gola? But a lot of people said that like, you know, Bob Cousy had great, great quotes about goal. It wasn't just will, but uh, yeah, it kind of shows the street cred of, you know, of, of, of his impact. I mean, can you imagine if, if will went to LaSalle, like, you know, he goes visit Kansas and comes back in a brand new car or, or gets, you know, incentive to go out there, which ironically is still the same in 2021 as, you know, you know, Zion's doing whatever. I mean, I don't know if, it's, if it's, that's not like proven or it, it, I guess it is now or you know, athletes get stuff. It is what it is. People go to Duke, UNC, big schools for a reason. But but on a sidebar, I'm not trying to go on a side podcast discussion, but can you imagine if Wilt goes to LaSalle, that changes the next 10 years of that. Mm-hmm. And then can you imagine if Kobe even went to LaSalle with those Kobe stories? I mean, could you be having the all-time leading rebounder in NCAA history and one of the top two, top five, top 10, depending who you talk to, people go to LaSalle. I mean, LaSalle, LaSalle would be a totally different university and school if those two players actually went to LaSalle. Yeah, and for anyone who with the Kobe thing, Kobe's father, Jelly Bean Bryant, played at LaSalle and then 
as Kobe was in high school, Jelly Bean Bryant was on the staff at LaSalle. And when you look back, was probably a fairly transparent way to try to put their fingers on the scale of getting him to go to LaSalle. But I mean, Kobe was never going to college. And if he did, but um, just to go back to Will real quick, because I've always sure. loved, I've loved this. I went on a sidebar there. That's my bad. I That's what we do here. The symmetry I love with Wilt and Gola, and it's, you know, shows that they were obviously, you talked about how they were able to get along, but just to show how different a guy they were. Wilt Chamberlain, very famously, when he was playing for the Sixers, essentially lived in New York and would come down, you know, the day of the game or whatever for practice, but he wanted to live that New York playboy life in the, in the sixties and then, you know, still play for the Sixers. Whereas Golo, when he came back from very briefly with the Warriors, when they moved to San Francisco, played with the Knicks, Philadelphia didn't have a team for a couple of years there, played with the Knicks, but spent a lot of his time commuting from Philadelphia where he was, you know, had his family and his, his sort of roots. So just to kind of show they both made the same commute, but the opposite way and for very opposite reasons. So. Yeah. And, and going back to, you know, making that extra phone call for an interview, Dave Budd from the Knicks was one of those extra calls, which ended up being, uh, you know, him telling me that they both lived in the area. Dave Budd lived in New Jersey. Uh, Gola obviously still lived in, um, you know, Fox Chase uh, neighborhood or yeah, Fox Chase or I'm bad with my directions right now with, with Philly neighborhoods, but he lived in PA and you know, they would, they would meet at egg to seven on the turnpike and just drive up together to practices and to games. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that that's really cool. It shows, uh, you know, the Phillyness of Tom Gola that he wanted to stay in Philly, do everything he did in Philly down to high school growing up I'm mean, high school, college professional. I mean, there's not many people nowadays you can say that has done that from, yeah. from start to finish, like literally like grade school, like successful in everything he did, even back in, you know, when he was, you know, probably like, you know, five ten in fifth grade, just dominating people and incarnation in Northeast Philadelphia. But um, yeah, it really shows the, you know, Gola's personality that he's willing to take the risk. And you know, if practice is at three o'clock, he's probably leaving at twelve, eleven thirty to just to drive two hours up there. And you know, I doubt transit system was was that great back then, but they just had to drive straight there. So I think it just shows that you know that really. A great personality that goal is and his, his tribute and, and his passion for the love of the city of Philadelphia. So he gets to LaSalle in 1952 or the 51, 52 season is his first year there as a freshman. And this was also where I learned, you know, I knew there was a time period where freshmen couldn't play. I always assumed that was just always a rule. I didn't realize mm-hmm. that was put in after his career. So he did play all four years at, at LaSalle under Ken Leffler, as freshman year, we talked about he decides, you know, he decides to stay at LaSalle or stay in the area instead of North Carolina State. They win the NIT, and the NIT was certainly a very, very big deal, almost on par with winning the NCAA championship, I would say, at that point. There may have been times earlier where it was bigger. I think by the 50s, it was probably, you know, pretty neck and neck. He's pretty quickly the best player on the team and really sort of establishes himself that he's the biggest deal from a college basketball standpoint in the city as a freshman. Yeah, actually, uh, NIT was actually flipped to what it is today. NIT was bigger than the NCAA tournament back in the 50s, or at least the early 50s. Mm-hmm. And uh, Gola kind of caught great strides because at a time when the NIT was very popular, so was Madison Square Garden, and which is, you know, he's in the Madison Square Garden Hall of Fame. LaSalle would play there probably at least two or three times a year against big, big names. And, you know, it's kind of back in the 50s at, at, uh, at MSG, you know, that was like the Mecca. I'm trying to think of an example now would be the Mecca because I feel like there's like 80 Meccas of basketball now in the in, in, in NBA and the basketball find a comp now just because it's so you know spread out but yeah it was sure madison square garden was in a lot of ways the center of the sports world Mm -hmm. teams would come and play games at the garden neither team would have anything to do with new york city they just come you know you'd have north carolina come play LaSalle or something at Mm -hmm. the garden you know neither team have anything to do with new york yeah and then on top of that boxing and the professional sports the Knicks. Rangers and everything. And it was, you know, and this was a time when 
stuff was much more regionalized. So like if you played really, they always say that 10 years later with Walt Frazier, one of the reasons he got signed by the Knicks was he had a dominant NIT final with Southern Illinois and at the garden, obviously. And they were like, Oh, we should pick this guy. And mm-hmm. it goes, so, so yeah, he, he's in the Madison square garden hall of fame. So they, they win the NIT in 52, you know, again, just to sort of underscore how different it was. Then they had a parade down broad street, to you know, from LaSalle to City Hall for winning the NIT. He was the co-MVP of the tournament, 22 points in the final against Dayton. And then this part I wanted to touch on because I thought this was interesting. That offseason, and correct me if I'm misstating any of the facts, they ended up playing Kansas in the Olympic trials where the winner of that game would get half their team on the Olympic team. Is that right? Yeah, I... And again, that's one of those things where it's kind of like, oh, wow, I didn't know this. And and as I kind of unearthed things in the book, a lot of those these examples came came to be. But yeah, I mean, can you imagine if that happened today? Like, that would be really cool to see, you know, Zion team up with, you know, six guys who are NBA players and they're playing whoever overseas, uh, you know, Czech Republic in, you know, the Summer Olympics or something. But yeah, that was kind of yeah, definitely unique. I'm not sure exactly... I can't remember correctly what year that ended, but again, that was one of those things where it was, you know, I believe the game was an MSG or. Um, yeah, I have this section up here. It was, yeah. It says they, uh, seven Jayhawks ended up defeating LaSalle 70 to 65 at Madison square garden in front yep. of 11,000 people. So. Yeah. So it goes back to the MSG kind of thing. Like it's just big game it was you know, the, the, the prime spot, like you said, the boxing fights and so and so forth. So yeah, it was kind of interesting. You called me, by surprise too. And, um, I talked to a few of the, um, I think Clyde Lavillette, if I'm, if I'm banking on the name correctly, yeah, that's, from Kansas that's right here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, talk to him and, uh, you know, it's kind of cool to kind of say like, yeah, what was that like, you know, to potentially, you know, potentially play for the Olympic team, which is kind of cool. Yeah. It's definitely one of the interesting chapters and that's kind of, you know, an interesting anecdote of the book where it's not just, you know, Hey, here's goal of scoring 25 points a game. It's like, Oh, I didn't know that, you know, goal of, that the LaSalle team could have had a chance to do that. So it was kind of neat to kind of unearth some of that stuff. That was definitely gone by 60. I don't know if they had it in 56, but it was at least the second to last time they did that. Maybe the last time. And I guess sort of the unfortunate thing for him too, was that that was his last shot at the Olympics as a fresh, like had that had there, had there been an Olympics in let's say 54, he would have made the team regardless as one of the best totally. players. But it, by the time 56 rolled around, he was, in the pros winning a championship with, with, uh, mm-hmm. with the Warriors. So the next year, 53 is sophomore year. Definitely the least of the, the four years Tom Gola was at LaSalle is definitely the least successful as a team. Although they still, you know, are really good. They still get to the NIT, but they're upset in the first round, which brings us to 1954 is junior year, which obviously we want to spend some time on. It was interesting that it was such a young team. There was nine sophomores, two juniors of which he was one and then one senior and just some of these games I'm looking at he had 41 points in a game against Loyola 31 rebounds in a game against BYU just really I mean numbers that there's no comparison to today you just can't you know you can't find any way to nobody grabs 30 rebounds in a game today yeah the last I guess the last person that has been a hardcore rebounder, even from, you know, I guess I'm talking more NBA. It was probably Kevin Love when he was mm-hmm. Kevin Love of the, of the uh, Timberwolves when he had that huge, like triple or double, double run. Oh, that was probably like 10 years ago now, but yeah, the 54 team kind of, I talked to a lot of the players from that team. They said that that was probably one of their best teams, but obviously they just caught, they got smacked in the mouth when they, you know, their heads were down, I guess, in a way. And they're, you know, that game was injury prone a little bit. Jackie Moore, Golo kind of a, uh, I believe injury prone. And like I said, uh, I guess th- them losing in 53 made them kind of a bitter, bitter taste in their mouth to go back the next year and just, you know, repeat. I mean, when you, when you think about it, they could have legit went to the championship uh, or some capacity in it or the NCAA four years in a row yeah. um, because, you know, they were probably the number one seed in 53 or, you know, top three team in the country. And they just, you know, it was, you know, wrong game, a, a wrong bad game to have a bad game on and that's kind of what they did against St. John's so they go into 54 uh, or they go into the NCAA tournament in 54 at 21 and 4 
and it's interesting to think about just how close it was to ending in the first round. They lo- they won in overtime against Fordham, seventy six to seventy four. Goal had twenty eight in the game, but it's just interesting to think about. You know, that's really the closest anybody got to them in that in that whole tournament run mm-hmm. was that first game up in Buffalo against uh, against Fordham, and then they come home. They actually get the next two games at the Palestra and they beat NC State and Navy in the Navy game, the modern equivalent of the Elite Eight. 22 points and 24 rebounds for Gola, and then they, uh, they're they on their way to the Final Four with a matchup against Penn State, which they win by 15, Gola with 19 and 19. And then in the National Championship game against Bradley, which was also coincidentally the first nationally televised NCAA championship game in history. They run away with it in the second half. They win 92 to 76 Gola with 19 again. And the LaSalle Explorers are the national champions. Yeah. um, It was really cool. Uh, I actually have the footage of 1954 and 1955 championship games. Audio is not the greatest, but it's kind of cool to see that footage. And I forget how I got, I think I got it from Gola's, brother or some capacity but seeing the footage you know like i said seeing lasalle win for the first time in 54 was really cool and seeing just bill russell dominant in 55 i'm sure to get to next um but yeah the 54 team it, it, it's kind of cool to see like you know lasalle was part of a, a group of first obviously the first ncaa championship game or championship for the, the university the first television broadcast was kind of cool a lot of first with that team in 54 i, I would say 54 is probably the most recognizable team from LaSalle and LaSalle's history, basketball history, obviously because we won. Uh, they won. We, I don't like to say we because I didn't play on the team. <laughs> but yeah, the 54 season definitely is, you know, a great year. And uh, ironically, you see it come back in the in the limelight, especially when LaSalle 2013 team played in Kansas City to advance to the Sweet 16. I mean, that was kind of a cool full circle moment to uh, to be a part of and be a student there too. In 54, as a junior, he was named, Tom Gola was named the Helms Athletic Foundation Basketball Player of the Year. Uh, He received the Paul H. Helms Trophy, and his name was engraved on the Hall of Fame Trophy in in the Helms Hall in Los Angeles. So that was his uh, Player of the Year accolades as a junior. And then heading into 55, again, we talked about how young they were in 54. Almost all of those guys were back. And the 55 team was realistically probably just as good as the 54 team, the one interesting thing I wanted to touch, you know, sort of at the beginning of the season was 1954, 55 goal of senior year was the first official year of the big five Penn, LaSalle, Temple, St. Joe's, Villanova, all playing in a round robin. We'll talk more about that later, but I always get a little frustrated when people go, Oh, you know, Villanova is the only team who's ever won a national championship in the big five era. And I'm like, okay, it was out hey, off by a year. They were the defending national champions when the big sure. five started and they got to one the next year. So, yeah. Um, and, and, and I'm not just saying this because, and it's, it's funny how you mentioned like the big five and other schools, but like, but Sal's, I mean, granted, yeah, I got to give credit to Nova, you know, obviously their, their history is great. They're number one, no matter what. But I, I, I'm not being a LaSalle homer when I say this, but LaSalle's history is is right up there. It should be number two or 2A with to tie with Temple. The history of the players, the Lionel Simmons of the world, you know, the Brooks of the world, the Golas of the world, like it has a really rich history. And I think sometimes it gets underplayed a little bit, or I guess not underplayed, underappreciated by people. Obviously, um, you know, we're alums and we, and we know that, but yeah, I just wanted to, you know, mention that, that LaSalle are the big five, not hatred, but like kind of, you know, Put some respect on LaSalle's basketball heritage, if you will. Yeah, and I mean, Tom Gold is the leading rebounder of all time, 2,201 rebounds in college basketball, a record that is unlikely to be approached, let alone broken. And Lionel Simmons, I think he's fourth now because I think somebody passed him, but Lionel Simmons, who played from 86 to 90 for a very long time, was third all time in scoring in college basketball history, division one. And he was only like 40 points behind the guy who was in second. And then Pete Maravich was way ahead of all of them, but Mm -hmm. that's a fine list to be second on. So yeah, you're right. It's, and we'll talk about another team that if circumstances admit different might be remembered differently. I just, which also involves Tom Golo and I want to touch on, but the Mm -hmm. 55 team. So again, just to sort of, they're 22 and four heading into the NCAAs. You mentioned Gola and MSG. 
his record at LaSalle or at MSG while he was with LaSalle was 15 and four. And again, think about those were all high profile games at the time, a 102 and 19 record, 102 wins, 19 losses. The four years he was at LaSalle, an NIT championship, an NCAA championship. And then in 55, when they're realistically just as good as they were the year before, the only difference is that they beat West Virginia, Princeton, Canisius in that game against Canisius in the third round of the tournament. He had 30 points, 25 rebounds, and six blocks. They go to the final four, they beat Iowa, and then they run into the Bill Russell, Casey Jones, San Francisco Dons, and their number is up. But hard to argue with losing to that team who was on their way to two straight championships. Sure. Those two players you mentioned are two that. Uh, man and myself that I couldn't get to interview for the book. Casey Jones, who obviously has passed away, I believe recently, his health wasn't the greatest. I tried tracking him down. If I could get anything before, you know, obviously, you know, I don't want to bother him, so forth. But I put in so many requests and got to at least knocking at the door to interview Bill Russell and just never happened. I even thought about going to one of his random signings in New York or somewhere and just be like, just be, you know, the journalist in me and just like ask him, Hey, can I get five minutes of time? Or even ask him one quote. I just wanted to have one quote in the book that I got that would be say, I interviewed Bill Russell and I didn't do it. I'm kind of pissed. I couldn't get that for the book. (laughs) That's the only thing I'm mad about, about what I didn't get. Yeah. And he's sort of famously a little bit reclusive, even to, you know, with justification, but you know, he, he was even sort of not somebody who really wanted to hear from a lot of people, even in Boston for a lot of years, after he retired, uh, I know we want to get to a little bit to his coaching years, but I just wanted to ask, I guess, both of you guys a question. So I lived, um, you know, grew up in New York, like Andrew, I've lived most of my time in D.C. and I went to school in Boston. So kind of, you know, Philly's like the one city that I don't have a lot of specific sports fan experience. But I know like here in D.C., you know, you always have things in a city that are part of sort of like the big ticket sports history. When people talk about, you know, five minutes on the sports history of the city. So like. You know, D.C., obviously, we have football and we got a little bit with the bullets. We got a little bit with the caps. Now the Nationals, you know, and there's these different college teams. There's the Maryland teams with Lefty Drizel in the 80s. And then there's Thompson and the Ewing teams. And, you know, in New York, even though it's not really a college basketball town, you hear about St. John's, you hear about Seton Hall. Do the Gola LaSalle teams that won the NCAA tournament do they ever get talked about sort of in the mainstream sports history discussions in Philly, or is it just kind of, it's so long ago that it's not really talked about? Yeah, I think, I think it's so long ago. I mean, there's nothing negative to say that, but yeah, I, I think, I think I agree with that. Like, you know, it's the only person I think that gets the limelight is, is Gola himself. When you talk Mm -hmm. about like, you know, 50, 50 ish team, and there's no problem with that, but yeah, I, I mean, I mean, 54 is a long time ago when you think about it. I mean, black and white games and, you know, you know, gray TV, you know, was TV even color back then? Like, I don't even think so. So uh, I guess you answer your question. I don't think, I don't think that that team gets the, gets the, you know, publicity, but I think just goal just kind of takes that and, and, and at the forefront of all that. I, I don't know if you agree with that, Andrew. Yeah. I mean, my experience is obviously a lot more limited. I lived down there in college and, you know, I've obviously been back, but not lived there full time since 2008. And certainly things have happened. The Eagles Super Bowl, the Phillies World Series since the Villanova championship since then. But the sense I always kind of got with when I was there that like when college basketball was talked about beyond people who had a real interest in it, it was the Villanova championship in 85 and then sort of the big five in generalities, you know, the palestra and they used to all play at the palestra and, you know, the sixties and seventies and throwing the streamers on the court and things like that. But you rarely heard specifics about any of the other teams. Although again, I was there the year after the Jameer Nelson St. Joe's team was, was, you know, so they talked about them, but you didn't hear a lot about, I mean, it's it's the same with New York and D.C. I remember the Northeast cities are pro towns. You know, you'd like them to have a little more room to talk about college. And I think Philadelphia, especially with the Big Five, they do talk on just the radio or, you know, casual conversations more about college sports than in some of these other cities. But realistically, they're pro towns. In Philadelphia, it's the Eagles and then Flyers and the Phillies. 
it's hard to find people who go back earlier than the 60s at this point in really anything, just because how old would you have to be to remember 19? You'd have to be at least in your late 70s at this point to remember that 1954 team, Mm -hmm. right? But yeah, nobody ever like diminishes it. It just doesn't come up. So they lose that game. And I do want to, you know, jump ahead in a second. They lose in 54. I thought it was interesting where you talked about him getting all these offers to play professional baseball, even though he hadn't really played baseball in, uh, you know, decades since he was a kid, Mm -hmm. just because we want to, I want to make sure we get into this. So he goes, he has his pro career with the Warriors to start out who were in Philadelphia at the time, right into winning a championship. You mentioned Wilt. He was not, he didn't play in the Wilt Chamberlain 100 point game. He wasn't even there because he was nursing an injury. Warriors moved to San Francisco, gives it a shot for half a season, doesn't really want to stay out there. Family doesn't want to stay out there. Asked for a trade back to the closest team, which at the time would have been the New York Knicks because the Sixers hadn't started yet. Begins his local political career in Philadelphia. And then in 1968, is called upon by his alma mater to come back. Can you just talk briefly about the circumstances that led to him coming back to LaSalle to coach in 1968? Yeah, um, so LaSalle obviously was sanctioned by the NCAA in 1968, or I guess a year before that. And, you know, LaSalle was in trouble. They needed a new coach. And the one, the one great quote of the book from Bill Bradshaw, former athletic director at LaSalle, is saying he had to make one call to Superman during the coaching search, and now was to Gola. And it was kind of one of those things where, you know, you kind of see now, it was kind of like, you know, the Steve Nash's of the world, these first-time coaches were like, yes, they had the experience, but like, all right, yeah, sure, let's give it a shot. And I think that's the same thing that happened in 68, 69 with Gola, is that they know he had a great rep- reputation. He has, his resume sp- speaks for itself. You know, he was, a, he was a big name to put, you know, butts in the seats and also to just maybe, you know, bring some, so street cred back to the program. So Goa com- comes on that that year in 68, 69, has this awesome, great team, 23 and one. But obviously they can't do anything because of they're sanctioned by the NCAA from the previous coach. They had been sanctioned for a few different things, improper payments to players through work study jobs with the cleaning service where they were probably getting no show jobs and just getting mm-hmm. paid, you know, to do work that they weren't really doing. And then I think there was something about, wasn't it some sort of, they scouted some tournament they weren't supposed to scout or something like that. And the NCAA just really dropped the hammer on them. It was known during the year that they wouldn't be uh, in the NCAA tournament or eligible. They have this 23 in one year, like you mentioned. I think their last game was at like, was they play like Westchester or something yeah. like that? It was like a very, because mm-hmm. that was that's always part of the story with that 68 69 team that, like, instead of ending in the final four or something like that, it ended on the road in some small gym that, you know, was really in the, not a fitting end. But, um, you know, the story is always, and he only coaches one more year because at the same time, he's doing still as a state legislator. And, you know, going back and forth and doing all that. So he just decided it was too much after the 69-70 season. But it's always been sort of a a conversation that people like to have about the 68-69 team. The what ifs, if you will. What if. Now, I, I have to be honest, I've always been one of these people who's like, you, you, you can't convince me that they were going to beat Kareem or Lou Alcindor and UCLA sure. during that dynasty where nobody beat them. But I understand where the motivation comes from, especially if you were a fan back then to say, well, we never got a chance to try it. But even as a LaSalle Homer, I just can't get there. <laughs> and I, th- I think even sort of to your point previously about, you know, what if they'd gotten Will, what if they'd gotten Kobe? That's another one of those things as a fan of a school who, you know, has not been a powerhouse for the last 60 years. Think about the place that the program would hold in NCAA history if they had beaten the Wooden Alcindor UCLA team. So as a fan or as an alum, I can understand why you would sort of grab onto that what if. And also think about even if they went and lost 69 college basketball and the media was just so much bigger than it was even Mm. 15 years before maybe that changes the trajectory of the seventies and things like that. So it's a fun, what if, but I've just never been able to get there with, they would have beaten UCLA. So. Yeah. I'm with you on that. I don't think, I mean, 
again, shoulda, woulda, coulda. There's so many stories like that over the last hundred years that you can say that about any team and uh, professional or college that, you know, what if did this will, you know, what ifs or what ifs for a reason, I guess. And just the last thing to wrap up his coaching career. He did say that that team that he coached that year and the, the best player on that team was another LaSalle big four legend, which is Ken Durrett. He did say that was the best team he was ever involved in at LaSalle, including the ones he was on. Whether he believed that or he was just trying to talk up his team, who knows, but they certainly had a case. So, you know, we don't, I don't want to give the rest of the man's life short shrift, but obviously with the focus on LaSalle basketball, you know, after that, he stays in, in local politics and ran for mayor at one point, was enjoying retirement. We talked about the, the fall at the, at the end of his life, but was there anything additional you wanted to sort of add about Tom Gola and his place in, uh, in LaSalle and, and any larger sort of Philadelphia basketball history, college basketball history, anything like that? Yeah, I think the main thing what I'm proud of that I wrote this book for is that I, I, it's actually a quote in the book from Brother Joe uh, Gravenstein uh, at LaSalle is, you know, history stands on the legacies of others. And kind of going back to what Dan said with regards to, you know, like, do people talk about X team or whatever? And it's kind of the same way of, you know, like I, 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 I was meant to write this book so people can talk about Gola more and the 54 team and, and know about his history and know about, you know, him as a person, a father, a neighbor player a coach so i'm just kind of you know just proud of the fact that people get to read this try to do it as depth in depth as i could to kind of you know tell his story and i think i did just that and, and more and it's really cool to see you know a, a person who you know did everything he, and, and he could in the city of philadelphia succeed in everything he did from politics professional career basketball career college middle school or excuse me grade school and everything else not many people can say that they did all that in one city they grew up in he was a National Player of the Year. He was a CYO champion. He won the city title with LaSalle College High School. He won the national championship and an NIT championship at LaSalle. And he won an NBA championship with the Philadelphia Warriors for good measure and then came back to coach LaSalle. There are a few people that are more integral to the history of Philadelphia basketball. And that includes the Sixers, the Warriors, the Villanova teams, anybody you want, high schools, you simply can't tell the story without Tom Gola. His number 15 is retired by the Explorers. The arena is named after him. The name of the book is, once again, Mr. All Around, The Life of Tom Gola. And we'll make sure we have a, uh, a link up to that when we put up the show. David, thank you very much for coming on. We really enjoyed it. And best of luck with the new book. Thank you. Appreciate the time. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. So that was our interview with David Grzbowski on the book he wrote a few years ago about Tom Gola and the Tom Gola era at LaSalle. We obviously touched on some topics a little bit out of chronology, specifically the 1968-69 team. We will get back to that a little bit later because I don't want to give that uh, short shrift. And we, you know, we got into it a little bit, but mostly from Tom Gola's aspect, but most people consider that the best LaSalle University team or LaSalle, just LaSalle team post Tom Gola, probably without question. So we will return to that. But just to kind of keep things sort of in chronological order, we will touch on the immediate post Gola era. So he leaves in 1950 after the 1955 season where the, they're the national runners up. And as we talked about in the interview, his senior season, 54-55, was the first year of the Big Five. And this brought a few things for LaSalle that were significant. That was the first year that they began play at the Palestra. Before that, so when they won the national championship, LaSalle, and, and for a long time before that, their home gym was at what's called Worcester Hall. And this is very weird when you first learn of this if you're a somebody going to LaSalle you know, around my age because – Wister Hall still stands. It is a three or four story academic building. And the bottom of it is the bookstore, which was obviously where the arena was. And, you know, with hindsight now, I can look back and say like, okay, maybe it was a little bigger down there than I thought it was. But when you realize like 
this was the building they played in when they were one of the best teams in the country and won a national championship. It's a little hard to process. Uh, <laughs> Wister Hall these days is famous for the absolute worst staircases. You essentially have to go up six flights of stairs to get to the second floor. Like, you, you know, you look at your, at your thing at the beginning of school year and you're like, oh, I'm on, when you're a freshman, you go, oh, I'm on Worcester 203. I only have to go up one flight of stairs. And you literally have to climb five stories to get to the second floor. Um, <laughs> and, and they're not, it's not a modern building, or at least it wasn't in 2006. So I doubt it's gotten any more modern. It's a million degrees in the summer and fall. But anyway, so starting in 1954, 55, what happened was all the five teams in Philadelphia LaSalle, Penn, St. Joe's, Villanova, and Temple agreed to a full round robin every year. So they would each play each other. So you'd play four games against your city rivals. All of those games would be at the Palestra. For a long time, every team's home gym was the Palestra through the 50s and 60s and 70s. They all played there. All five of them? Yes. That's really that's just so unique. And I'm that, always just so struck by that. And that's one of the things that broke up the big five, which I think, again, will be a much deeper episode. But Villanova started to want to play more of their games in their home arena. And then they started to say, well, we're only going to play. We'll play away games at the Palestra, but we're only playing home games in our gym. And then Temple with Cheney started to, you know, John Cheney said something along the lines of the Palestra is a great gym, but it's on the wrong campus. And gradually the whole thing kind of but. Like I said, that's that's a whole extra thing. And and a big deal back then was you would have double headers. So a lot of times you would have, let's say, LaSalle and St. Joe's would play. And then the late game would be Villanova against a like a national powerhouse. And it wouldn't always be Villanova. Sometimes it would be LaSalle or St. Joe's or Temple. But you'd have sort of like an early game that was two big five schools. And then you would have a late game which was you know you might see cincinnati with oscar robertson or you know you might see jerry west where did you did jerry, where did jerry west go i think he was at west virginia jerry and i just remember because in the palestra museum they have like all the great opponents who played there yeah so you'd see some of the big national stars in addition to the big five games which were such a huge deal eventually the big five the famous um and i've been in the building when they brought it back once but the thing that made one of the traditions of the big five that was famous was after your team scored their first basket you would throw streamers onto the court so if LaSalle scored to go up two to nothing, they would, and the whole, all the whole, all the fans on the LaSalle side of the building would throw streamers onto the court and they'd clean all the streamers up and then if temple scored all the temple fans would throw streamers onto the court and then they'd stop and clean it up. And other, other schools in different areas started to do similar things. So the NCAA put a blanket rule down banning it and the big five tried to get a waiver. They wouldn't get it. It's been brought back a couple of times. And I was actually at a game when it was brought back. It was uh, LaSalle against temple in 2014 and they had an agreement before the game John Giannini, LaSalle's coach, and Fran Dumphy, the Temple coach, and also a LaSalle grad, that they would just do it and then violate on the free throw. So LaSalle hit the shot and then just took a big step. Or LaSalle, you know, LaSalle scored, did it. Temple took a big step over the free throw line, so the free throws got waved off. Then Temple did the same thing. LaSalle stepped over the line, the free throws got waved off, and then the game began in earnest. But and something tells me we will touch on Fran Dunphy uh, a little bit later on as well. I will be objective about it. But so big five aside, you know, the, the late fifties for LaSalle, they experienced, you know, a dip. They went after goal left. They went a good 10 years before they played in any kind of postseason play again, which we'll touch on in a second. You know, they did win the big five a few times, but um, as you look at sort of the stats in the immediate aftermath of Tom Gola leaving, you know, the next year, 15 and 10. And these, they're good teams, you know, by all rights, they're over 500 every year. Usually something like 16 and six is like an average number. The one thing I did want to point out in this era was in 1958, for the first time they joined a conference, they'd been an independent up until this point, they joined the mid Atlantic conference, which at the time was, 
a lot of schools that are familiar, St. Joe's, Temple, Lehigh, Rutgers, Delaware, and then some and Bucknell, but then some schools who aren't exactly associated with big time basketball anymore. Muhlenberg, Gettysburg, but it was the first time they joined any kind of a conference and lots of central Pennsylvania schools there. And that was the conference at one point, and we'll touch on it later, the Mid-Atlantic became the ECC, but this was the conference LaSalle would be in until the early 80s. Now, conferences weren't as big of a deal back then. Certainly, the Big Five was LaSalle's sort of unofficial conference all those years, but um, you know, it is significant that it's the first time they joined a conference. The other thing I thought was interesting is that simultaneous with Gola leaving, the coach leaves, uh, Loeffler, Leffler, he leaves as well he maybe he went he goes to texas a&m and maybe he saw the writing on the wall because you wouldn't think a coach would leave a team that had just come close to winning two straight national championships had won one and then lost in the finals to bill russell the following year so it's interesting to me that he would have left right away i'm assuming it probably has something to do with the fact that that gola left i also thought it was interesting that his replacement was a guy named jim pollard who Maybe at some point we will talk a little bit more in depth about he and him and his teams. He was the he was a player. He was uh, one of the other forwards, uh, one of the front court guys on the George Mikan Lakers in the '40s and early '50s. The teams the team that won a bunch of championships, and he comes right from right from the NBA, retires in '55, and then goes right to be the LaSalle head coach. So it's interesting. Number one, that Loeffler leaves right after two really good seasons. And then number two, that um, they get this Hall of Famer and guy who won so many championships in the NBA that comes right in off the, you know, right from playing and to coach the team. And to go to Texas A&M is kind of strange because Texas definitely in those days, not a basketball powerhouse compared to Philly. And especially that might have actually been, was that when Bear Bryant was still at Texas A&M? That's a good question. I don't he was around then because I think fifty four was when he went to Texas A and M, if I'm not mistaken. So maybe, maybe, yeah, because I think Bear Bryant also became the athletic director there. Let's take a look at Bear Bryant. <laughs> By Bear Bryant. Bear Bryant got there in fifty four. He's Bear Bryant's first head coaching was actually in Maryland in forty five, and then Kentucky for a bunch of years, and then A and M, and then Alabama. Does it say if he was the AD at Texas a and I know he was the AD at Alabama for a long time, obviously, but I think for a little while he was the AD at A&M. I do not see anything. Oh, no, he did. You're right. In 54, he was also the athletic director at A&M. So, so he might have, that, that might have been a reason for Leffler leaving. Was he got hired by Bear Bryant? Yeah, Bear wow. Bryant hired Leffler to be the new, uh, new head coach at Texas A&M, the new head basketball coach. So... We're kind of moving into the early 60s here. They do go back to, for the first time, they get uh, back into the postseason in the early 60s. I believe it was 1963 is when they get to the NIT. Let me just pull this up. Unfortunately, the franchise index only lists the NCAA, so I'm trying to also remember the NIT uh, appearances as well. Let me postseason. Yeah, so they... That's the NCAA, excuse me. Yeah, so in in 63, they get back to the NIT. They're in the NIT in 63 and 65, both times losing in the first round. The one thing I did want to point out in this era, sort of a name that most people will recognize, from 1960 to 1963 was the career at LaSalle University of probably our most famous alum at the moment. Peter Boyles, unfortunately, passed away, the father from Everybody Loves Raymond, when I was in college is Bill Raftery, lead color analyst on CBS, the man who screams onions. The legendary, as he's gotten older, is a legendary for his being able to drink, out drink men half his age. Um, <laughs> there are a litany of stories about Bill Raftery as a, uh, a legendary sort of, his daughter has told stories about how he can't, his, you know, his, his children can't keep up with, with the, with Bill Raftery and his wife, I saw something on Twitter a few months ago it was saying, I guess there was a debate about like, oh, who, which sportscaster would you like to go out drinking with? And then somebody tweeted like, if your 
saying anybody but Bill Raftery, you don't know enough about Bill Raftery. But anyway, <laughs> he's still involved, you know, uh, to a limited extent with the program. They have a Bill Raftery golf outing every, um, usually every spring, spring or summer, somewhere in there, you know, to raise money. And he's uh, still, when the occasion arises, speaks very highly of LaSalle. Obviously, given his schedule and his broadcasting, he's not really there for games at any point, but um, is one of our most famous alums that's hard to argue with. And we, I don't know if we mentioned this with David, but he wrote the forward to David's book. And unfortunately, we didn't have the time to ask him about getting Raftery to write the book and his interactions with Raftery. But I'm sure that would have been interesting. We also remember Raftery. I remember Raftery because even though most of the lion's share of his broadcast work has been in college, he did uh, Nets games on, well, I think it was Sports Channel back in the mid to late 90s for a few years. So I remember him from doing Nets games when I was, you know, 12 or 13 years old. So, you know, you mentioned the coaches and the, there's some sort of bouncing around with the coaches. Uh, before we get into that, was, do you know, what was Raftery, was he a good player? Did he ever, did he play in the NBA or was? I don't know if Bill Raftery played in the NBA. Let me check. I, let me look at his, I mean, I know he played, he wasn't a superstar at LaSalle, but he, did, he wasn't like a, you know, he didn't ride the bench or anything like that. For anyone who's listening and is like, how could you not know this? Like, who might be a, a LaSalle fan? I'm, you know, I'm trying. It's it's tough to learn about a lot of things from 50 and 60 years ago that I, some of which I knew already, but there's still a lot of gaps. So this was the era when freshmen couldn't play. And it looks like his sophomore year, he only played in four games, I'm guessing due to some kind of injury. But, um, you know, in 60, 61 and 62, 63, he is 60, 61. He averaged almost 18 points a game. In 62, 63, he averaged about 13 points a game. You know, so he was, the stats from this era aren't super complete, but yeah, he averaged almost a double double because he was averaging just under nine rebounds that second year, is, is what I guess would have been his sophomore year, just over seven rebounds his uh, senior year. Like I said, the points, you know, in the high teens, the one year and in the mid teens, the next year. So, and it looks uh, like he was drafted in the, into the NBA by the Knicks, actually uh, 82nd overall pick, which in those days was the 14th round today it would be, you know, the, the third, which doesn't exist. So he was drafted, but never played in the NBA. He went right into coaching. So yeah, that was during that era. He was a, uh, you know, in retrospect, he's the most famous LaSalle alum of sort of the between as we'll talk about, there's sort of four big pillar eras for the first, you know, 60 years of LaSalle basketball from four different sort of pillar players. We've talked about Gola, who was obviously number one. We're going to get to number two in a second. Um, so sort of the between those two epics is in the early 60s was when um, was when Bill Raftery was there. So you mentioned coaches, and this would be a good place to, to sort of, you know, maybe uh, wrap up half number one here as we go, you know, I've talked about Tom Gola and the early origins of the program and, and immediately following Gola and sort of the history of the school. By the mid sixties, you mentioned, you know, the coaches had, had bounced around a little since Leffler left guys were there for a couple of years. And there was a guy named Jim Harding who was there as the coach by 1967, 68, they had a, assembled some really good talent on the team. You know, 1967, 68, they went 20 and eight there, you know, had some guys, Larry Cannon, who's one of the best LaSalle players of all time, actually became just the fifth guy whose jersey they retired. They just did it recently. It used to just be four of them, and, and they've since retired his number. You know, they had a guy named Bernie Williams, no relation to the later baseball player, Fatty Taylor, Fran Dunphy, later to be the coach of the uh, 10 Quakers and Temple Owls. Lefty Irvin, who was also about, you know, was a future coach of LaSalle later on. So they had assembled this pretty good core team in 1968 they finally got back to the ncaa tournament for the first time since the 1955 ncaa championship game they lost to columbia in the first round and as the 1968 you know as they looked forward to the 1968 1969 season there was plenty of reason to be optimistic and the coach was this jim harding who only coached them for one year and this is a quote i don't know if you were going to read this from 
Mr. Uh, Mr. Grzybowski's book here from David's book. And uh, apparently his big thing was he was, you know, he was like a Vince Lombardi type. He was a guy, you know, hard practice, yelling, all that type of thing. And in fact, one uh, longtime uh, sports writer in the Philly area. And again, this is in uh, David Grzybowski's book on Tom Gola said, if the WWE had been as popular then, Jim Harding would have been the perfect Sergeant Slaughter. He was a tyrant. He was a bully. He was one of those my way or the highway type of guys. Yeah. And that's actually when I got this book, the first time I opened it was happened to be to that page. And I'm a big wrestling fan. So the first, I was like, I happen to open this book. And the first thing I see is a reference to Sergeant Slaughter, which I certainly was not expecting in a book about Tom Gola. Harding is only there for a year for reasons we will get into in part number two as Tom Gola reappears on the scene at LaSalle University and one of the most famous seasons of all takes place. All right. Well, you can look forward to that in episode number two. Thank you again to David Grzybowski for joining us and check out his book, Mr. All Around, The Life of Tom Gola. Join us next episode for even more LaSalle University basketball. Until then, I'm Dan Newman. And I'm Andrew Newman. Fight on Explorers. Goodbye, old sports. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sports history books pick up your copy today soundtrack provided by kevin mcleod of filmmusic.io